welcome to a special call joint meeting uh, between uh, the city of Paducah and McCracken County. Uh, we'll start off and I'll ask um, our um, assistant city clerk to please take roll. Commissioner Gold. Present. Commissioner Guest. Present. Commissioner Henderson. Present. Commissioner Wilson. Present. Mayor Bray. Present. And clerk, would you call our roll, please? Commissioner Parker. Here. Commissioner Jones. I'm here. Commissioner Bartlett. Here. Judge Executive Clark. Here. Okay, uh, could I ask uh, Reverend Henderson uh, to please, uh, we'll stand in prayer. Invitation. Gracious God, our Father, again, we are grateful for this day that you've given us, and we're grateful, God, for the blessings that we right now enjoy. Fathers, we come now to talk about important business. We pray that you would be in the midst of our meeting. We pray, God, that you will, be, that you will guide our thoughts, that you, more than that, that, that you will guide our understanding. Bless each of us, Lord God. Bless our city. Bless our county. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Stay standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So this is my first uh, joint city-county meeting, and uh, so I'm honored to have, uh, you know, my fellow um, uh, county judge executive and county commissioners here. Um, and I know we have important business uh, tonight to talk about uh, the possibility of a new uh, sports tourism park uh, right here in Paducah. Uh, I know the judge is uh, very passionate about it, and I appreciate his leadership uh, up to this point, him and, and really all the commissioners. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Judge, and let you uh, take it from here. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, am, uh, I am passionate about this. I'm excited about it. I, I uh, I uh, want to just take a couple of minutes to uh, tell you why, and I think that this is a it's an exciting project. I think it can uh, it can really move our community forward, and uh, we have the opportunity to to do this. And uh, it's just uh, you know uh, the energy is behind it. I think the public's behind it, and uh, we want to uh, make sure that uh, you guys and ladies. Uh, are on board with with understanding and being having input into this project, and so, um, you know, to me, uh, in government, it's like in life. There's times when the stars align and the timing is right to move boldly forward, uh, and this is the time and this is the means. Um, our children play soccer on a landfill, and it's just embarrassing. Uh, our baseball, softball fields are in uh, critical need of rehab. Uh, the best possible site for a sports complex has been donated to the county. Donated to the county. And it is in a location right between two existing city parks, right on the greenway, right on a highway, right at a traffic light, and right in the city. So it's accessible to uh, the inner city kids just like it is the, the children and, and the adults that are uh, spread throughout our county and even uh, across our um, region, multi-county region. It's no exaggeration to state that this project upon completion will transform McCracken County and Paducah into a vibrant and growing sports area. It's no exaggeration that to state that this will be, in my opinion, the greatest economic development enterprise that the city or the county has ever undertaken <clears throat> in our history. Uh, nothing else comes close. Nothing comes close. Uh, it's no exagger exaggeration, perhaps even an understatement, to acknowledge that while this complex will provide tremendous economic development growth to our community, it will at the same time provide a facility where our children where our, uh, uh, and adults can enjoy the facility uh, at the same time it's generating income. Uh, I, it's, a, it's a great point to understand. 
and to enjoy it for generations to come. Uh, so at the conclusion of this presentation, I'm going to ask the uh, city of Paducah to join with McCracken County as full partners on this project on whatever we jointly design, whatever we uh, jointly agree upon. It may be something similar to this draft. It may not be. But uh, we want to work together. We are, the, the city's a part of the county and the county's a part of the city. And so, uh, you know, we've made tremendous strides. Uh, I, uh, this body with the previous administration and, and with this one. Um, together, if we join in this, uh, the ask will be up to $20 million from the city to join with our up to $20 million. Uh, and then we can accomplish what I think our mutual goal is, is to make this community a better place, and in this instance, a far better place than it was when we assumed office. And so we have the need, we have the means, we have the time, we have the, the place is right. The only question is, in my mind, just do we have the will? Do we, do we have the will to go forward and do this? Um, Steve Doolittle has a presentation he'd like to make just for a couple of minutes before we get into the um, design <coughs> presentation. Steve. Good evening, commissioners. I, I will be uh, uh, brief. The master plan presentation you're going to hear this evening uh, by, by Jeff Cantor did not happen in a vacuum. There, were, there was a, a starting point. The starting point goes back uh, many years, but, but what brought it, brought it to the forefront was something that was going on at the city and something that was going on at the county. It started with a, with a parent asking Commissioner Jones why we can't have bathrooms at the, at the soccer field. Seems like a reasonable question. A park should have bathrooms, but it's because it's on a landfill, and it's on a landfill cap, and we can't breach, breach the cap. And so it started the conversation with the fiscal court about how can we do better than, than we currently have, both for our children and both for attracting business to, to Paducah. And it, and it was going on at a good time because the city of Paducah at that time was working on its master plan, its parks master plan. And so there, were, there was a joint uh, meeting in, in this room in the spring of, of 2019 where, where we talked specifically <coughs> about, about soccer. At that point, the county had... Um, engaged uh, um, a local company, uh, Mark Workman's company, um, to to just get together and gather some graphics and ideas for us and show us what if we just did soccer, what that might look like and what that would cost and where where we might do that. And that that grew into the city of Paducah in um, let's see, it was in June of 2019, releasing an RFQ to search for. Uh, consultants to do a complete master plan. <clears throat> in August of that year, we received proposals from over 10 companies and a, a group of people from the city of Paducah and McCracken County uh, met together and we, we picked two consultants. And we advanced that to the newly formed Sports Tourism Commission. The Sports Tourism Commission was really jointly formed by both the city and, and the county as we restructured our, our tourism assets to keep the existing CVB and add what is essentially another CVB, but one specifically tasked with the mission of creating sports tourism um, opportunities in, in the community. We passed those two consultants on to them, and they, they ultimately picked uh, Peck Flannery of Paducah, who partnered with a company called Hitchcock and another company called Pros, and you'll hear a lot more about, and, and Bacon Farmer Workmen of, of Paducah, partnered with um, um, those groups to do for us a master plan. That's where we're, where we're really at at, at the, this point, is just the master plan. Nothing's been designed. Um, designers haven't been hired uh, yet. All we've really got to this point is a master plan and, and a location. <clears throat> Um, so with, with that, I'll, I'll introduce Jim Dudley. He's the chairman of the Sports Tourism Commission, and, and he'll do his piece. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve, and good evening, everybody. And he said, I'm the commissioner of the Sports Tourism Commission, and, and when we came together, we really focused on what our core values were going to be, and, and this wasn't just a, a one meeting. This is, we took three meetings to do this. 
And we said, why are we here? You know, what's the, why did the city and the county put us together and, and bring us in? And so we asked some questions, you know, what's important to us? Um, what defines success? And, and what will be most valuable to our customers? And, and by customers, you're talking about the youth that the judge mentioned. You're talking about tourism, people coming in. Um, and you're talking about the parents, and that's a big piece of it. So when we really started focusing on that, we kind of came up with three core values for the Sports Tourism Commission and what we've made every decision based off of. Um, our first one was heads and beds. You know, as a Sports Tourism Commission, we want to bring in tourism. We want to bring in economic um, development and economic impact to our community. Um, we all know how great Paducah is. We know how, how great it is to live here. We want people to come in and see that. Uh, and from going downtown to, you know, the mall area, wherever you go in Paducah, this is a great place. Let's get people here to see that. So we focused on heads and beds. Uh, second thing we focused on was transparency and honesty. You know, what can we legit look at and build, be transparent with the public, get their opinion on it. Um, we, we've asked tons of people. We've had tons of meetings. We didn't take that lightly. Uh, we wanted everybody's opinions. We've talked to the local leagues. We've talked to the soccer, um, softball, baseball, met with people outside the area. I mean, tournament directors, everybody, we've gotten input on it and gotten their opinions. And then lastly was overall experience. Um, not just the field experience, but the community experience. Uh, if you guys have never been a part of a travel ball family, when you go to these areas, when you travel to communities, it's not just about the ballpark. What's the hotels look like? What do you do in between games? You know, last weekend we were supposed to play three days in Cape. We got rained out. We spent three full days in Cape waiting to see if we were going to get to play softball. Well, they didn't have stuff for us to do. We're not going back there. Instead, we spent, I don't know, my family spent over $1,000 in three days and, didn't, and played one softball game. So that's the type of impact you're looking at when you build something like this. All your stores, the shopping increases, restaurants increase. Um, so we put all that into what we did each time. And then when Jeff, and, and I'm going to let Jeff come up here and start his presentation, every time he's had a meeting with us, every time he's done a presentation, you'll see those core values embedded in what they've done on their end um, at PFGW and, and in his team. So um, I just wanted to kind of share that with you guys so you understand what our thought process was and how we came to this point with our team um, and just kind of what our goals are as we move forward. So with that, um, I'll introduce Jeff Canner with PFGW. Just bear with me a second. I can get things. All right, Michelle. Oh, there we go. Oh. I knew it goes idle more than fifteen minutes. I knew this was gonna Okay. Um, thank you for your patience in that. Technology is a necessary evil. Um, well, my name is Jeff Cantor. Um, I'm a principal and project architect at PFGW Architects here in Paducah. Uh, we've been in business for 57 years in this community and uh, are proud of that fact. And, and most of our work is within an hour and a half drive of this community. Um, we are thrilled to be a part of this project uh, because this is personal for us. It, it affects us. It affects our children, our communities. Um, and, and so um, everything that Jim said, we echo completely. Um, as we were assembling a team for this, we knew we, we don't get the opportunity as PFGW to design outdoor athletic complexes that much. We just don't get that opportunity because of our limited, um, on our purposeful limited scope of uh, service area. And so we went out and found the best. Uh, and, and we found Hitchcock Design Group was recommended to us uh, by another firm that we had partnered with in the past. Um, and, and that has uh, proven to be a, a, a relationship that, that I value greatly. Uh, Hitchcock is um, top notch and uh, consider the, the, the two guys we've been working with personal friends now through this project. Um, 
Randy Royer and uh, Eric Hornig are the principals uh, that, that have worked on this project. Uh, this, this firm is based out of Chicago and Indianapolis, and so uh, they design these facilities all over the Midwest. Um, Pros Consulting was another consultant that we brought on the team. Hitchcock has worked with them in the past, and, and they bring to the table a lot of experience with, with recreation planning and management, uh, the business side of things, um, pro formas and, and revenue models, expenditure models. Um, Philip Parnon is the uh, principal there. These guys couldn't be with us tonight uh, just because of travel schedules and things like that, um, So, uh, but they're watching. Um, and are a phone call away if needed. Um, and then Bacon Farmer Workman is our other uh, team member here in Paducah. Kenny McDaniel and Susanna Campbell um, have been uh, instrumental in, in uh, a lot of the, the research that has gone on uh, throughout this process. Um, and as Jim mentioned, th these principles, uh, th these are a little bit different than what he said, but these, the, the heart of these principles is in everything that Jim mentioned. Uh, these principles, uh, I went back through meeting slides last night as I was preparing for this, and um, the common denominator in every presentation we made to the Sports Commission uh, was this slide. Um, without a doubt. And so the, these principles drove everything we did as, as, did as a design team. Uh, the first principle is to become a regional destination for athletic tournament play. That, that's the heart of this project. That's why this project even exists, is athletic tournament play. Uh, principle two is to provide high quality athletic experience, experiences for the local community. And the judge uh, spoke to that. Uh, we want this to be both and tourism and local use. Uh, and that's the heart of the Sports Commission as well. And then principle three is to further develop the unique brand and identity of Paducah and McCracken County. Um, we've got something special here and we want others to know about it and we want them to come back because of their experiences that they have uh, when they come for athletic tournaments. Um, our process started um, a long time ago, um, as Steve uh, mentioned, we, we're um, we're probably about a year in at this point, um, and and we had three tasks for this uh, for this part of the project. Our, our first task was a research and analysis phase. Uh, we just wanted to get get the research in. Um, we wanted to to analyze different sites that were identified as potential locations for this complex. Uh, our task number two was a schematic design phase. That's where we would take the information that was uh, uh, formed and discovered in task one and begin to put that on paper. Uh, what does that information look like? How do those, uh, what we find in task one, how does that define task two in the design of this facility? And then task three was a master plan phase, taking the schematic design and, and further developing it into a, a cohesive master plan that sets the trajectory of this complex for generations. Um, our, our task one, and I'm just going to kind of go over these really quickly. We, we identified four different sites. The, we had four different sites identified for us uh, that we were to study. Um, and, and through that research and analysis phase, we conducted site visits with the entire team. We did uh, uh, kind of some behind the scenes uh, work with uh, um, uh, you know, flood assessments, uh, utility assessments. We, we prepared uh, the site analysis uh, for each site. Uh, we did land use diagrams, yield studies, how many fields could you fit on a site. Um, some of the sites were, were rather large and rather flat. Some of them seemed good at the time, and then the further we dug in, we realized uh, they weren't that good. Um, and so we, we did all of these things, and, and a clear, two clear sites rose to the top. Um, and, and in the end, there was only one site that, 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 that won out over all the others, and that was Bluegrass Downs. Um, the, the fact that, it, and, and, and honestly, the, the fact that it was being donated, because at the time we didn't know the status of that. Uh, we just knew its location was prime, um, that it was a, a facility that was not being used. There was no future purpose for it at the, at the time. Um, and so that's why this site won. Uh, and the fact that it was donated to the county was just bonus. Um, and so uh, our task number two uh, was we, we pre prepared several different alternatives through the schematic design process. Uh, we, we prepared drawings uh, to present to the Sports Commission. Uh, we prepared some uh, initial construction cost opinions. Um, and, and you know, knowing what we know at the time, um, the very surface level, very conservative. Um, and then we issued a final report um, uh, at the end in fall of 2019. Um, 
I'm sorry, 2020. Uh, I try to block 2020 out. Um, so um, after we got done with the schematic design phase, we, you know, some of the things we did um, was was we researched the community. Uh, you know, PFGW and BFW, uh, we know the community because this is our community. But Hitchcock and <clears throat> Pros, they they just they had some education to do, and it was it was it was fun to teach them about our community, um, about the river industry, the arts, UNESCO Creative City, food, uh, how important food is, and, and the culinary arts, uh, fiber arts. And then looking at the, the site that won out, uh, looking at the history of those sites with Bluegrass Downs and, and being a, a former horse racing track, and then Stuart Nelson Park. Uh, not only the, the, the legacy and the, and the history and, the, uh, and cultural significance of that park, but the legacy of Dr. William Stewart Nelson uh, and, and, and his life, which um, I dug in and just, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but I, I dug in and I, I kind of feel like I'm an expert on, on Dr. Nelson, uh, even though I'm not. Um, so it, all of these things um, defined our design process. Uh, this, this wasn't designed in a vacuum. Um, this wasn't designed as just another facility that was to be plopped down on a piece of land in a community. Uh, this is Paducah specific and McCracken County specific. Um, out of this process, we created several different sketches, and, and they, they kind of, as you see, the, uh, the kind of the, our process here, there were kind of hand sketches at the beginning, and they got a little more developed, a little more to scale, and then uh, some, some final schematic design drawings that, that were presented and, uh, and approved uh, by the Sports Commission, which then took us to task number three, our, our master plan phase, and this is just where we further refined the, the schematic design. Uh, we assembled these master plan documents, looked at the operations, the business side of things, um, and, and, uh, and issued this final report on February 5th, uh, 2021. Um, before we go any further, there's some assumptions that, that, that we all need to be clear on, um, and, and this kind of helps us as we go through this. Uh, the, these assumptions defined our process. The, the McCracken County Athletic Complex, that's the name of this project in our office. Um, there's no name for this. We, we don't have a name for that. The identity has not been, uh, uh, the, the name has not been defined. And so this is just what we call it on our team. Um, the full build out of, of this complex is designed to include Stuart Nelson Park. Um, uh, the project can be phased if necessary. Um, the, the standardized field sizes are preferred, um, and, and as we go through some of these drawings, you'll see that the soccer fields are the largest size you can get uh, cause they, because they provide the most flexibility. Um, and uh, the baseball fields, again, are, are one of the larger sizes you can because that makes that brings in more flexibility. Uh, so, and that was one thing we heard when we went. I was able to go on the, uh, the site visits with the Sports Commission back in uh, September, I believe. Um, and that's one thing we heard consistently through all the sites that we visited around the region is they, they wish they had standardized fields uh, in, in the sizes of those uh, because it lends the flexibility. Um, all the fields are, 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 at this point, designed to be synthetic turf. Uh, that, again, the final decision has not been made there, but that's just what we assumed in going through this process. Uh, the facility will operate at cost neutral. Uh, the county will implement an owner-operate model, contracting services where needed, or some hybrid of that. Uh, again, those decisions uh, are still being formulated um, in, within the Sports Commission. Uh, local league play will be accommodated Monday through Thursday with tournament play on the weekends. Again, that gets to the heart of the, the, the design of this facility as sports tourism, uh, but also a, a complex for our community as well. Uh, user fees and field rental rates will be commensurate with market rates, and the site will host baseball, softball, and soccer tournaments with the possibility with the rectangular fields of hosting non-traditional sports uh, such as lacrosse, rugby, uh, flag football, and that's where you start to get into to, uh, greater flexibility on those fields. Um, one of the first things we did was an athletic field analysis in the community. Uh, we, we inventoried the existing facilities both in the county and in the city, uh, and you'll see those numbers there. Um, the, the county inventory there at 18 uh, combined baseball and softball fields, that's, that's what comprises of, of the Reedland Farley Baseball Softball Association, Heath, 
and Lono. That's the number of fields in those three facilities, and they do use those interchangeably between baseball and softball. So that's why that number is just lumped there. Uh, the rectangular fields for, for the soccer uh, uh, complex out of the county, um, and then the city inventory of those fields as well. Um, and that helped us think about our program and, um, and, and how that would be developed. Um, the core program that was developed by pros and, and, and with our team, uh, you see here at the bottom of the slide, um, this was uh, our, our first start was with the Pinnacle Report that was completed uh, early on in this process with, with the formation of the Sports Commission. Uh, we took that was our starting place. We took that report, digested it, we read through it, um, we, we um, used that as our jumping off point, and so these numbers are. are are in line with what Pinnacle Report suggested and recommended. Um, baseball diamonds, uh, six. Uh, softball diamonds, two. And, and the, with the baseball and softball uh, diamonds, or the ba baseball diamonds do have some flexibility to be used both for softball and baseball, uh, depending on setup. Uh, and then the rectangular fields of six. And you see the, the number of acres you need per field, the number of parking uh, acres you need per field. And then you see this core program that, that was developed, uh, you need a minimum of 44 acres just for the parking in the fields. Uh, that doesn't include any amenities that make this, <clears throat> this complex unique and special and, and more attractive to, to people that come in. Um, our design principles, we, we needed the size of the park to be set 60 acres or more. Uh, the service radius would be determined by the demand and the outcomes. Um, site selection, the, this standalone facility near arterial streets, um, it, as was mentioned previously, um, this is a great location. Uh, it's right off the interstate. It's in between downtown and the mall area. Uh, our, our two main commercial districts uh, with dining and hotels. Um, and so this was... Um, you know, a, a clear winner in that respect. Uh, the length of stay um, that, that we designed around was a two or three hour experience for single day activities um, and then for all day tournaments or for special events. Um, amenities, we, we, we needed a minimum of six athletic fields in one setting uh, to make this thing even start to make sense. Um, but along with that, you need public restrooms, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, ample parking, the, the turf types that are appropriate for the facility, for the facility field lighting, um, and then all these amenities that you'll see throughout this complex master plan are all designed to be ADA compliant and accessible. Uh, we did, equity of, of uh, usability of this complex is important. Um, revenue facilities, we needed to have four or more revenue facilities. Fields are a revenue facility and rentals, concession stands, shelters, uh, rentals, retail space. Um, land usage was, was it about a 95% and five active and 5% passive. Uh, and that simply means that, that most of this property, most of this complex, is going to be actively engaged. There's gonna be very few areas that are kind of, um, if you think about Noble Park, the, the area behind the tennis courts over there, the wooded area, uh, that's just, it's, it's not very active, it's a, it's a passive area. And so this is kind of that passive, active um, um, uh, concept. Programming, and I'm sorry, this uh, cut this off here at the bottom. Uh, focus on active programming of all of the of the spaces. Um, I think is what that says. Um, this is the third time I've done this, and you'd think I'd have it memorized by now. Um, maintenance standards. Uh, if you don't maintain your facility, um, you don't have a nice facility that people come back to. And so maintenance standards are are uh, crucial. And, and and pros helped develop a, a list of maintenance standards uh, that that walk us through. Uh, you know, level one, level two, level three, level one being the most attention needed. Level two, some attention needed. Level three is more of the passive areas. And so there's a already in this master plan a a, a detailed um, uh, maintenance standard. Um, uh, 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 map for, for this facility. Um, parking has to be sufficient to support the amenities and also meet local zoning ordinances uh, we have w within the city. Uh, lighting uh, for, for uh, nighttime <coughs> games, but also security lighting as well. Uh, we, the last thing we want is to ha turn all the lights off at night and then we leave it wide open for, for people to come in and, and mess things up. And so uh, the, there's security lighting, but also it extends the, the length of uh, game times on these weekends as well. 
uh, signage, directional signage and, and facility amenity regulations. Uh, that, that's important so people can find their way around. Landscape design and enhances the complex and the experience. And then the naming of the facility, um, we don't know. Uh, but, but there's options about naming it after a prominent or historic person, a partner, a landmark. Um, th those things have yet to be decided. Um, we, we've, we've discussed, and, and even, even today, uh, this afternoon, we have been discussing natural turf versus synthetic turf. Um, the, you see uh, on this slide, um, <clears throat> there are costs with each, both installation costs, there are maintenance costs with each. A lot of times we think that, that synthetic turf, you just put it down and you're good to go uh, for eight to 10 years until you need to replace it, and that's absolutely not the case. Uh, and so these, these slides kind of walk through that. There, there's a, um, they, they almost become a wash at, at some point um, about uh, the, which one is the most cost effective. But, but the, the thing that, that we've designed around is that synthetic turf provides the most flexibility. Uh, in the event of, of weather like we had last night, uh, where we got, I don't know how many, two inches of rain overnight, um, synthetic turf fields are playable sooner than natural turf most of the time. But now we're starting to learn about some systems. And you think about Major League Baseball, um, they turn those fields around pretty quick. Now they're tarped, the infields, but the fields can turn around pretty quick. And, um, and so we're, we're still walking through this with the Sports Commission about which is best, which is the um, best value, which is the best for playability, for usage. And so these, these discussions, this is still a very fluid situation, um, no pun intended. Um, the, the programming for the full build out of this facility, uh, the baseball field sizes are, are designed at 300 feet um, down the fence uh, or, or down the foul poles and, and a little bit more to center. Uh, the softball fields are designed uh, for 300 down the, or let's see, yeah. Um, and so they, they just kind of walk through, I'm not going to get into the details here, um, but standardized field sizes. Um, and so uh, once we started to determine these, this really affected um, how many fields we could get on the facility. And, and, and the larger the fields, the more flexible they are. Uh, and then you see that with the multi-purpose rectangular fields as well. And, and the real big difference here, um, if you play younger kids on a, on a full-size baseball field, you still only have one baseball field. Um, but you play younger kids on a full-size soccer field, you can subdivide that field up into four different fields, two different fields, three different fields. And so all, all of a sudden you go from six fields on the oldest age group to a younger age group, three to four <coughs> fields per field times six. You can get up into the 18, 24 fields in one complex. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of the rectangular fields. Uh, the, that's um, uh, an important caveat. And that, that plays into our hotel room night calculations as well that we'll see in just a moment. Um, <clears throat> and so um, that's uh, kind of what drove these standardized field sizes. Uh, the, so the primary program elements, I'm just going to kind of gloss through these. Um, six multipurpose rectangular fields, six baseball fields, two softball <clears throat> fields the appropriate staging and warm-up areas, um, restrooms, parking. Uh, we have about 782 spaces uh, accounted for on this master plan drawing right now, uh, which is enough to, to accommodate the, the fields, the turnover between games. Um, we need field maintenance and, and bulk storage. We need walkways, uh, site furniture, tables, chairs, benches. Um, Stormwater detention will be an issue. The, these are all primary program elements. Secondary is concessions and, and merchandising. Um, you know, the ticket booths uh, for, for that, uh, playgrounds, splash pads. Um, I, you know, I, we don't do travel ball. I've got an 11-year-old son, and, and I'm, I'm fighting it tooth and nail. He's wanting to do travel football, and I'm just not wanting to do that. Um, but for a younger sibling of a child who's playing in a game, they need something to do. Uh, so these playgrounds, these splash pads, or these other amenities that give the younger siblings or even older siblings uh, something to do, something that, that can um, – 
keep them occupied and, and make it a fun experience for them too so it's not just about their sibling. Uh, shelters uh, for community use, for, for tournament use, for teams to gather in. Championship plazas um, are, are uh, another, just a, a, a program element that adds another level of experience uh, to these facilities. Um, as, as the judge mentioned, this, this complex is, is skirted on the north side by the, uh, not even skirted, it's bounded on the north side by the Greenway Trail as it runs from Noble Park to Stewart Nelson Park and then over to McCracken County Park across the Lieber Bridge. Um, and so trail connections become very important as we engage our local community and give them opportunities to use this park through the week and have these trail connections. And then sport courts, uh, multi-purpose basketball, pickleball, uh, just an, another layer of, of, of use for tournament um, users and local uh, users as well. Um, the hotel room potential, this is where we start to get into the, the heads and beds, this principle number one uh, that, that defined this project. Um, you see here soccer, the first three columns. Um, U13, U 19, U12, 11, and 12, and then U9 <coughs> and 10. Um, you see the, the number of fields or the number of teams per field. So it, in a, on a tournament weekend, you can get eight teams per field. Uh, number of players per field, 11. Total players per field, 88. Number of people per family per player at, at two and a quarter or two and three quarters. Uh, and all these numbers start <coughs> to add up. And so the total number of visitors per field for that U13-19 group is 242. Um, and then you start to, to do that math out and, uh, and you start to get these potential hotel room nights. Um, and these are all calculated at a 45% occupancy rate. We're, we're assuming 45% of the people that come to these tournaments will actually stay in a hotel. Uh, some, some folks come and they Maybe they lose and they just go home. Uh, or maybe they live close enough where they don't stay in a hotel and they drive an hour back to their house or, or whatever. So, so these, these numbers are very conservative um, and, and they're that way by design. Uh, we want to make sure that, that we're not um, being misleading in, in any of these numbers. Um, so you start to see that the numbers increase with soccer. The hotel room nights go up as you get in a younger age bracket because the number of fields change. Uh, flag football is, is um, not as many. It's, it's, kind of, it's one of those sports. It's kind of a, it's a um, on the edge sport. It, it's not a, a, a real big player in all of this in the travel circuits. Uh, but then you get into baseball and softball and you see the hotel room nights there with 37,000, um, or I'm sorry, the hotel room nights for 6,200 uh, for, for baseball and then 2,000 for softball. And so you, you see that soccer offers the most hotel room nights, and it's because of the flexibility of the fields and the sizes of the fields. Uh, this, this generates a, a, a total hotel room nights annually of 20,000 hotel room nights. Um, and, and as uh, you know, Michelle uh, Campbell was saying on the webinar this morning, the tourism <laughs> webinar, that, that uh, at some point in March through the indoor facility, they reached an 83.8 uh, occupancy rate at, at some point in March on a weekend. Um, and, and that's fantastic uh, in, in the middle of a, a pandemic. Uh, so you start to see how these numbers translate out, uh, conservative numbers. You see the total tournament visitation at 132,000 people. Uh, that would come into our community and act and use this complex uh, for its intended purpose. And this doesn't include the locals that would use it week in and week out. Um, and Jeff, did you say yes. that, that uh, that's for a one day tournament? Yes, uh, these are these are these are hotel room nights, um, and, and we'll get into to a little bit more of the calculations in a minute. But yeah, th these are uh, one nights. One night stays, so this would be a Saturday night playing into Sunday. Uh, so these numbers, again, then would fluctuate if somebody came in on a Friday night uh, because they had an early Saturday morning game or they stayed, you know, didn't have school on Monday or did and, uh, and stayed Sunday. You've done that, haven't you? Yeah. Um, or, or stayed Sunday night and then went home Monday. Uh, so this does not take that into account. These are assuming one night stays. Um, and so, again, another level of... of, of uh, conservatism there uh, in, in these generated uh, calculations. Um, 
operational strategies uh, is kind of the next thing we talked about and, and actually talked about this with the Sports Commission last week in their meeting. Um, operations includes contract management. Uh, there, there's uh, management of, of contracts with uh, promoters, uh, tournament organizers, um, uh, vendors, uh, all of these uh, contracts that, that would come up in a, in a complex like this. Uh, equipment management, managing and using the, the, the function, maintenance, life cycle replacement, replacement technology. Um, you've got to manage the equipment that helps to maintain the facility. Human resources, attracting and hiring and re retaining qualified personnel. Um, maintenance management, knowing when to clean the fields, how to clean the fields, how to take care of the fields, how to... Um, you know, maintain the uh, the the right um, uh, level of, of moisture in the fields and fertilizing, and, and even just cleaning bathrooms. How often do they need to be cleaned? How um, all of these things go into the maintenance of the facility and the management of that marketing and branding. Um, this is how people hear about us. This is how um, this complex that the word is spread about this complex. People's um, Social media is, is king, uh, whether we want to admit it or not, and people's impressions about anything are put on social media for all to see. Uh, a good experience leads to, to good reviews and good comments. Bad experience goes the other way. And so, so marketing and branding this. And then risk management. Uh, this is another operational aspect uh, that, that uh, re, re, you know, repairs, securing insurance, handling claims, inspections. Um, all of these things go into the, the, the operation of a complex such as this. And you'll see a whole another list over there to the side. Um, there's different approaches to operations. Uh, there's the own and operate model, uh, where where this uh, uh, the the county the the sports commission would own this complex and operate it. Uh, there's pros to that. There's cons to that. Uh, for the t for the sake of time, we won't go through every one of these. But um, uh, the the pros are there. There's total control over the complex. Um, that you know they they can. Um, there's financial control and all of that. The cons is it creates a new agency. It, it's, um, it, it, it puts a, another layer of burden on people that, in the sports commission. You know, they, they do this for, for no pay. Uh, they're volunteers. And so to put that another level of burden on them to run this facility. Um, and then there's the own and outsource model. Um, and then, uh, and so there's, there's pros and cons of that. Uh, you can find a, a, a management company that could come in through an RFP process where they could come in, uh, present their uh, proposal to, to manage the facility, um, and then you turn that over to them. Uh, the cons to that is, is you start to lose some control over the, over the complex. Uh, and then there's a, just a, a multitude of hybrid approaches, uh, playing to your strengths, um, uh, and then um, making up for your deficiencies. Where you have a deficiency in managing this, you find somebody that, that has a strength in that and you, you retain their services. Uh, so these things are, are all things that we're discussing with them, presenting to them. Uh, again, we discussed it last week, uh, had a great discussion, uh, great questions. Because uh, this is a big decision. Um, getting the design right is one thing, but if it's not operated properly, it doesn't matter what the design is, and so these are these are huge decisions that have to be made. Um, so I'm going to switch to the video. Um, maybe. All right. So this is a fly through. This is uh, the master plan model, 3D generated, a fly through of the facility. There's no sound. Um, I'm just going to let it play, and I may speak over some some highlights as we go. Um, and yes, you will see moving figures. You'll see the same guy like 37 times. Uh, just it, it's humorous. Um, <clears throat> So this, uh, this road that you see coming in here to this first parking lot is from 32nd Street. That's a traffic light at 32nd and Park Avenue at, at uh, uh, Chip Wynn and, uh, and Watermark Honda. Uh, the, the two softball fields are to the right. 
the building you see here uh, coming up, the big building, that is the existing grandstand for Bluegrass Downs. Uh, that is something that we see as an asset and not a detriment. Um, nobody can think of another athletic uh, tourist destination in the country that has a horse racing grandstand as its central feature um, in, the, in the facility. Uh, so we intend on renovating that, repurposing it, and using it um, to, to make it a, a signature feature. Uh, you see here the, the championship plaza on the right as we pan around back towards the, uh, the fields. Um, you'll see a lot of landscaping. You'll see a lot of paving um, <coughs> options and, and designs. Those are just things that nothing's set in stone yet. Uh, those are just things we add in there to, to enhance the feel of it, and, and those things do enhance the, the, um, the experience at the complex. This is the championship baseball field or softball field, depending on the, the, the tournament. Um, they're in front of the grandstand, so you can sit in the grandstand and watch that game under the cover of shade or potentially inside a, uh, an on-site restaurant or, or something of, of the sort. Um, these are the sidewalks that, that uh, go back into this, um, this first uh, set of five baseball fields. Um, but you'll see every, everything is, is designed in such a way to have a, a sense of permanence. Um, the, the bleachers, um, some of the bleachers are designed to be moved, some are, are, are <coughs> stationary uh, to provide some flexibility. Um, shelters, here's a, a playground here in the, in the middle of this uh, set of five baseball fields. Uh, concessions, restrooms. And this is moving back down toward um, the, the parking lot that comes off of the Metcalf Lane area, um, kind of in behind Finish Line Car Wash and that general area. Um, I'm sorry, Expressway Car Wash. Um, that would be where the maintenance buildings are and some of those behind-the-scenes facilities that, that uh, the public doesn't really uh, want to see or need to see. Uh, batting cages, uh, there's th 12 batting cages total on site. Um, this moves into the Stuart Nelson Park portion. Uh, we've created, and, and you'll see some still images of these uh, spaces as well. Uh, we envision this as Stuart Nelson Plaza um, to, to not only create that public space uh, for the community, uh, but to also better tell the story of Stuart Nelson. Uh, it, it, the only thing that tells a story at that park is a, is a small plaque that was uh, uh, erected, uh, I think, five years ago. And so we, we want to do better. Uh, we envision doing better with that. Um, and then this gets into some, uh, some of the areas, passive areas to the right here, uh, moving up into the soccer field areas with the associated parking lots, um, concessions, restrooms here for, for this side of the complex, uh, a splash pad spray park area here uh, that, that we've envisioned. Uh, shade structures are important. Uh, and then just the sheer size of these fields, um, it, it's kind of hard to, to appreciate the size of these. Um, and then you see the multi-purpose sport courts there. Um, and then this road that you see going off to the right of the screen and off uh, the right-hand side of the screen, that's Stuart Nelson Park Road, just for orientation, that goes back out to Park Avenue. care about the next video. All right. So again, just a overall image of the site. You start to see the, the trail connections. Uh, the Greenway Trail comes up along um, this north side of the property, up around Stewart Nelson Park, and ties back in with the Leaper Bridge. Um, Again, overall shot of, of, uh, of the site from the Park Avenue entrance. Uh, we see this is the, the main entrance, the grand entrance. As you come in the traffic light, uh, you cross this bridge. Uh, we, you know, with, with this uh, 
this part of the site being the former bluegrass downs, we envision, uh, you know, horse type fencing, uh, kind of that split rail fence that you see that it's kind of reminiscent of, of the, the central Kentucky area around Lexington, uh, because this defines not only the, it, it tells the story of the past of this site, uh, but also just creates an environment that, that's, uh, reminiscent of Kentucky and, uh, in this area, uh, the softball fields, um, championship plaza again just a place where at the end of a tournament teams can gather and um, and be presented their trophy before they go home with wonderful experiences of paducah uh, the grandstand uh, we envision this as kind of the central gathering spot with the, with the main concession area um, seating up in the, at the bleacher part uh, we envision this uh, this far right side this upper level is, is that fully enclosed clubhouse uh, we think that might be a great restaurant uh, or some kind of food service facility. Uh, there's restrooms here. There's gathering spaces for teams. There, there's check-in areas for teams, for tournaments. Um, we see here on the far right of this a, a vendor court where, where vendors can set up and then sell um, uh, uh, you know, things, souvenirs, that kind of thing for these tournaments. Um, uh, a view from the grandstand looking out onto the championship field. Um, I think this next slide, one of the things that came up um, after the master plan was completed was, was an idea of, of, of what about a stage? Is there, an, is there a possibility of adding a stage in this backstop area to accommodate a small concert? Uh, and so we've, we've looked at this. Uh, this is a really rough um, concept of what that could be, uh, but, but it's certainly possible. Again, adding to the, to the uh, number of and types of events that could be held on this property and in this complex. Um, the five diamond fields and, and the associated core there with the concessions and restrooms, um, the amenities of the playground, shade structures. Again, looking back over to Stuart Nelson Park portion, um, this is the area where the five uh, or four current diamond fields are. Um, and, and you see the big green space here. That's just, a, again, just designed public green space uh, for, for community gatherings and events. Uh, we have shelters right there off of that green space. Uh, we do have a stream that runs through there that, that, uh, that needs to remain. Um, these shelters and, and this public plaza, we envision, uh, again, telling the story of Dr. Nelson, his, his contributions um, to, to the civil rights movement, to, um, to education. He was an educator, um, president of several universities, um, and uh, finished his career at Howard University. Uh, and so just a, a, a great scholar and, uh, and, and, and civil rights leader that, that no, not too many people know about. Um, and so we want to uh, tell the story better uh, and, and envision doing that in some, some unique ways. Um, again, the core area of the soccer uh, rectangular field complex, and then just, again, an overall image of the site. This is the part that everybody dreads. Um, I am including myself in that because these, these, uh, these numbers are, are, are big. But as you see from the, the video that you just saw in the images, you saw this is a big project. Uh, this is, uh, I can't remember the acreage, um, about 90 plus acres, uh, 60 acres or so, 70 acres or so from, from uh, Bluegrass Downs and another 35 usable acres at Stuart Nelson Park. So they, we're up over 100 acres at this point. Um, and so um, I will preface this with these numbers are based on the generated images you saw. We don't know quantities of anything except fields. Uh, we don't know restroom finishes. We don't, there's a lot we don't know um, because of the, the, what we were tasked with in coming up with this master plan. We weren't tasked with those details yet. Um, so these numbers are, are very conservative. Um, they're based on real projects uh, that Hitchcock has completed recently. Uh, they're based on their own experience and, and, um, and uh, doing these projects. Uh, they're based on current, um, at least at the time this was done, um, current construction costs and, and, and everything. We know some things have changed and we've got some escalation built in here um, to, to account, we hope, for, for some of these um, price increases that we've seen. Um, but 
you know, this, this number, this 41 million, and this is different than what's in the master plan report. Um, I found an error last week going through the spreadsheet. Uh, we were accounting for seven soccer fields at one time, and we backed it off to six because we were getting into some, some wetland areas, um, and we never changed the number in the opinion of cost. And so <clears throat> we've knocked a million dollars off the cost uh, overnight. Um, and I know that, you know, that helps, but, but it's not enough. Um, but the, the, this number is, is full build out, full feature, full amenity, splash pads. This is kind of the, the, um, the Mercedes version. Um, now what you'll see to the, the next two columns to the right, you see a low range and a high range. Um, the low range is simply, it, it's 85% it's of this full feature project budget. Um, and that's just, a, a, what if we were high on our numbers? Uh, and so it, it's, it's got a, a safety factor in there. And so this, this could be where it falls. It could fall within this 30, $35.5 million range. Um, if we were a little low on our numbers, uh, and we don't anticipate that we are, but in, in case we were, we, we've added 5% for this high range, and so we get up to $44 million then. Um, but we really feel like um, we've been conservative enough that, that we don't, unless the scope changes, um, we don't see this going higher. Um, the thing we, we've done in the last four columns is, we, is we've broken these down by site. Um, you know, what, what's the cost associated with each site? Just so we kind of see that where the breakdown is starting to fall uh, and what it costs to develop a, a diamond field complex versus a rectangular field complex. Um, each of these sites is different. Uh, the sizes are different. Their current uses are different. Um, and so all of these things play into it. So the bluegrass down site just building the fields and the, and the, the necessary amenities to make that work with parking and um, is going to be in that $17 million range just for bluegrass downs. You start adding amenities uh, such as uh, the grandstand uh, re renovation, uh, these uh, playgrounds, and, and some of these other uh, amenities that, that make the park and the complex that much more attractive and special and, and a destination. Uh, there's another $5 million there. Uh, and so you start to see the Stuart Nelson site again. Uh, just the site, uh, infrastructure and fields, eight and a half million. Uh, the amenities are 1.7 million. Um, and so you start to see how these break down a little bit. Um, under other project costs, um, we are carrying um, quite a bit of contingency at this point because we just don't know a lot. <clears throat> Um, we've got a design contingency in there of 5%. Uh, we've got a bid contingency in there of 5% in case when this thing goes to bid, the bids come in higher for some reason, like COVID uh, escalation prices. Um, we've got a construction contingency in, in there of 5%. Um, there's almost $5 million there just in contingencies uh, that we think are, are very conservative. Um, the construction contingency, I, I think that's probably safe. Uh, design contingency, I would say that might could be adjusted uh, downward. Um, we've got construction testing services in there. We've got escalation um, in there for, for a period of one, three, five, and seven years. And so you'll see that in these pink um, cells over here to the right. It, if we were to just do the bluegrass down site, um, and, and there would be an escalation factor there of $346,000. If we just did that site in year one, if in year three we decided to add the amenities, there's going to add another $300,000 uh, to the cost of the project on top of the $5.1 million that the amenities would cost. And so that's kind of how that works. Um, it, it adds that cost because you've waited. Uh, it, it's, it, it's only going to get more expensive to build in all likelihood. Um, and so with labor costs and time and the cost of money, um, and so that's what those numbers represent. Um, design and engineering services, this is not our fee. Um, we have thrown a number in here uh, for, for this second phase of the project uh, with, with the design development and construction documents and construction administration. We haven't even given a fee on this yet. We haven't been asked to. Uh, so this is just a placeholder. Um, 
uh, construction phase services um, would be uh, probably included in our fee. So that's you know that's in there as a <coughs> as a separate fee, but that would probably be included within our fee uh, pr percentage fee for this project. And so there, there's a lot of um, a lot of unknowns at this point. There's a lot of um, uh, generalities that have been taken in developing this, um, and so we we don't. We don't want you to look at this and go, oh, $41.8 million. Um, that's a lot of money, and it is. But that's by no means, we, no bids have been accepted, no drawings other than these renderings have been done. Uh, so it, it would be unfair to, to say that that's the project cost at this point. Uh, it's a projected cost. And so... Um, And this is just kind of a, a, a visual uh, breakdown uh, of, of how these sites, the, the cost breakdown per site. This purple here at the bottom, that's the fields. You can see that the, the field development and construction is by far the most expensive part of each site. Um, and you start to see some of these others, the site structures on the bluegrass down site, that number is, is you know, $5.6 million because you got the... the, the um, the grandstand building, you've got concessions buildings, uh, the, the vendor court, um, but you get over here to Stuart Nelson Park, site structures is $400,000. We've got one small concession restroom building, um, but the fields, again, are the, the vast majority of the, uh, of the project cost. And so that's just a, a, a graphic representation uh, that, that just helps you kind of see where things are, are falling. Um, <clears throat> operational plan, uh, we discussed this a little bit ago. We, we've divided the project into different zones, athletic zones, champion zones, event zones, and operational and common areas. Um, you can see here the, the, where, what are in each of these zones. Uh, the athletic zones are the fields and dugouts and bleachers and restrooms. Uh, champion zones are the, the championship fields. Uh, there, there's a championship diamond field, and there's also a championship rectangular field that we're accounting for because uh, we didn't want to cheapen that, uh, that, that uh, experience for the kids that are playing <coughs> soccer or lacrosse or something like that. Um, so we do have championship fields in each zone. Um, event zones and, and then um, operational and common areas, um, disc golf playgrounds, and we know the disc golf course is affected by this and we're working on that as we speak, uh, figuring out which holes exactly that, um, that affects and, and what can be done to, to remedy that. Um, um, in fact, I'm I, uh, meeting with uh, Kevin Leneve on uh, Friday, Jim and I are, and I thank Amy to, to just He's the president of the local disc golf club here in Paducah. Uh, go to church with him. Um, so um, we're meeting to, to kind of just talk through things. How, how does this affect him? How does this affect their club, the play of the, of the course? Um, and so, uh, so we want to learn. Uh, I, don't, I don't play disc golf. Um, <clears throat> if I'm as bad at that as I am real golf, there's no reason to play it. Um, and so these operational strategies, the organization and operation structure, again, nothing's been decided. But this, this slide kind of gives you an idea of, of the number of people that would be needed to, to run a facility like this, a, a director uh, in some, some form or fashion, a brand and communication manager, a maintenance manager, maintenance techs, uh, laborers. Um, uh, you know, you, you need a, an event manager that, that will help um, schedule the events, the tournaments. Uh, you need people under that person that, that will assist in recreation and merchandise attendance. Uh, um, and so th these are all some of the things that, that go into um, operating this complex, uh, staffing it. How does, that, wh how does that look? Who does it and, and who, uh, who operates it? Uh, the operational plan, as I mentioned, uh, we, we've uh, developed these tasks. Um, and so you see the turf maintenance. This is for synthetic. Uh, it tells you who the staff is that does that, what the task is, and the frequency that the task needs to occur. And so these things are already in developed, uh, development. Um, you see the hard surfaces there, the you know, save sidewalks. A maintenance laborer uh, will re remove sand, dirt, and organic debris weekly or as needed. And so that's spelled out. And so there's no question about when things needed to be done uh, to maintain this facility. Uh, 
the financial plan, the capital funding source opportunities. Uh, we, we know the transient room tax uh, was uh, created for uh, these type of things. Uh, there, there's uh, different grants, there's bond issues, there, there's um, land and water conservation funds, local, national, regional foundations. There's naming rights, uh, which, which will be a, a huge part of, of, uh, of, of funding this facility, we think. Um, there's partnership development agreement development agreements that could uh, be uh, brought into play, uh, public-private partnerships, recreational trails programs because of the trails we're, we're having uh, connected with this complex and the trails we have going through it. Um, and so there's just a, a, a lot of different avenues to explore about how this could be funded. Um, Operational funding uh, includes user fees, concessions, parking fees, permits, tournament fees, um, uh, concessions uh, that are, are the official food and drink and equipment sponsors. Um, that, that would be like Coca-Cola saying we're going to be the sole provider of soft drinks for this complex. Um, scoreboard sponsors, um, there, there's Wi-Fi revenue, there's advertising revenue, um, batting cages. Uh, that brings in revenue. Um, volunteerism, while not a source of revenue, it does help offset the cost of hiring people to, to have volunteers that, that come in and, and, and provide a, a service uh, for a specified amount of time. Um, special fundraisers and then uh, private management of elements of the complex like this potential restaurant that would be somebody that would come in and run that thing um, uh, the, you know apart from this and then uh, it would just be part of the complex. Um, the six-year pro forma for a full this is full build out uh, <coughs> this is not phased uh, we anticipate with the revenue uh, generations we've done and the expenditure generations that, that have been completed we anticipate uh, this facility in first year running a deficit of about $400. Um, now, we've made a lot of assumptions here. We've assumed synthetic turf for all the fields. We've assumed a lot of things that we don't know yet, but these are based on pros consulting out of Indianapolis. They, they have done, this is what they do. And so they, these numbers are, are things that they see in projects they've done in, in uh, municipalities across the nation. Um, and these aren't just, they don't just do these in Indiana. They go across the nation and do this. Uh, so these numbers are, are trustworthy. Um, in the second year, you, you see some modest gains uh, throughout year six. Um, these assume a full year of operations. Uh, so if this facility opened up in September, that's going to be different uh, than opening up in January. Um, and so uh, sponsorship revenues are not accounted for in this model. Uh, so, so any naming rights or sponsorship like that, these, these are not included because those are anticipated to be placed into a, a, a reserve fund for maintenance and upkeep and, uh, and for debt service and capital projects on this facility. Uh, this does include $1.5 million in expenses for debt service with an annual increase every year. Um, and then it assumes all synthetic turf fields and that all fields are lighted. So there's some, there's some big assumptions here. Um, but you see, um, you know, if these assumptions are, are close, first year in the red for $400 is pretty good. Um, naming rights, again, the, these were not included in those revenue models. Um, but these just show you some of the potential naming rights and, and the, the, the revenue they would bring in. Uh, we've accounted our calculations for this total potential five-year income at the mid-range column. Uh, so there's a, there's a low range, there's a high range, but we're just shooting down the middle here. And so you start to see that, um, you know, a, a naming the facility, a, a, a naming sponsor for the whole facility uh, could bring in $1.5 million over the span of five years. Um, and so you see at the bottom, this, this total sponsorship opportunity is $3.2 million, um, which is significant. Um, then I'm going to let Jim come up and share these last two slides um, as I'm um, just uh, thank you for Can I ask letting a quick us question on, yes, the, uh, on the expenses. Yes. Did you say that that included debt service? Yes, that does include uh, $1.5 million in expenses for so debt the service. $4 million first year, that includes $1.5 in debt service. Yes. And that covers how big of a debt? Um, I don't know. I can Didn't find they? that out. 
this is where I, this is where I wish Phil would have been here tonight, but uh, he just couldn't make it down here. You know, roughly, Steve. Twenty million. Twenty million. Okay. What you said? Twenty. Twenty million. A million yes. for twenty. So, are are we going to take questions now, or do you want to? Let's wait? let let's let Jim present okay. these last couple of slides, and then I'll come back up and, and answer questions. So, give Jeff a small break, and so the other thing we wanted to look at was also, and the judge mentioned this. He says probably could go down as the greatest economic impact this area has had, and possibly forever, right? Um, and it's easy for me to sit here and show some pretty pictures and say I can do this, but can I put my money where my mouth is? Well, I can. The first thing we did as sports commission was we bought four courts for the Expo Center, basketball, volleyball. So Michelle got those installed August, September of 2020 in the middle of COVID, a pandemic. Um, but she's been able to put some events on since September till March. And just to throw out some real numbers, and these are direct spending, from September to 2020 to March 21, she's brought in $1.2 million in lodging, uh, $1.4 in food and beverage, $1.2 million in retail, $640,000 in recreation, and $650,000 in transportation. So $5.3 million in direct spending my commission has already been able to bring into this area with four courts during a pandemic. Imagine what we can do with this complex. And that's what these numbers right here will show you. Um, you're, you're looking at one day trips that first number so if we just had one day tournaments people drove in saturday morning played ball all day drove home saturday night they're going to spend on average 36 dollars or between 29 and 36 dollars per person so if you got four people in your family 36 times four if they spend one night here they're going to spend between 110 dollars and 128 dollars again per person so you take those numbers right there and you figure in what's that going to bring into our area I'm bringing a minimum of eight to ten million dollars a year in direct spending. That's not indirect spending. That's not new employees. That's not new jobs. It's not that dollar turning over. That's direct spending into our economy. Okay, that's our shops. That's our restaurants. That's our hotels. Um, and that's for single day tournaments. I told you what our core value was was heads and beds. So that means that's two day tournaments. So double that. I'm gonna bring you in sixteen to twenty million dollars in this thing. And what happens when we start getting into the big tournaments, your showcase tournaments that are three and four day tournaments that these teams pay three, four thousand dollars to come to? I mean, the the potential is endless, right? You build a mecca of a complex that nobody can compete with. I mean, who can compete with this within five hours, six hours, possibly longer? Um, so we understand the ask, but we're putting this right back into our economy. And it's going to create jobs. He showed you a slide of, I think if I counted off the top of my head, 21 jobs this complex will bring in. That's tax dollars. That's people moving to our area. They're buying houses if they can find a house. Um, you know, living in apartments, whatever that looks like. <clears throat> so this complex is going to do exactly what all you guys want, right? It's economic impact. It's growth. It's new jobs. So that's why we're as passionate about this as the judge is. Um, this sports commission, we're behind this 110%, put the work in, we've done the research. You know, he talked about volunteerism. We're all doing this on the side. None of us are getting paid either. So we're sitting there in meetings, traveling to sports parks, checking this stuff out. Um, and, and I can't tell you how many times I've called <clears throat> Jeff or Steve or somebody after I've seen an idea or something like, hey, man, we need to figure out how to do this. I mean, it's kind of what we think about now. So we wanted you guys to have this number too because it's one thing to spend money. It's another <clears throat> thing to realize what it's going to bring in. And, and I think the judge kind of hit on that. So now you can ask questions for myself, Jeff, whoever, whoever asks questions. Hey, the city folks, uh, you've not, I mean, the mayor and uh, Commissioner Wilson have seen this presentation or very close to it. You've done it three times. This, yeah. this is a little variance. Third, anyway. third time's a charm. Uh, so, well, so whatever y'all have. And, well, let's go back to the question about debt service. So. What's assumed in the expenses is that there's $20 million of debt. And so it cash flows with that, with that debt service. So we went over this in some deal with, the, um, with, with Phil, uh, the consultant at PROS, about this. And there's sort of assumptions on top of assumptions. Um, you know, it's the first full year, you know, depending on when you launch. And it assumes everything goes perfectly, and it goes, and it assumes that the business model 
that's preferred in the master plan is exactly the one we we implement like we would um, we're absolutely reserving all weekends for tournament play we would never have a local event on on a weekend it assumes um, you know certain enforcement of cost even for the local recreational uh, aspect for the rental of fields you know so it doesn't allow for you know maybe collectively the body comes and says now we want to do local soccer here and we want to give them a certain number of weekends and we don't we don't recover all of those costs that are predicted in the business model so so we have a bunch of choices to make before before i would say that yeah absolutely it's going to turn a million and a half it it can if we if we um uh, adopt the business model and say that's that's how we're going to run this but that requires some some choices on our on our part it also um, requires that even though it produces uh, money it produces revenue we can't go out and borrow money based on that revenue we, you know we do debt you know vis-a-vis -vis, uh, general obligation and it might help us support the payments that we that we put in um, later uh, but but we have to be prepared for what happens if it doesn't produce the revenue. Um, you know, then we're going to have to dig that out of our pockets. Okay. I know you've got a question. I have a list. <laughs> well, I, I want to go back to that because if that 1.5 million is set aside for debt service, that would bond 20 million. Would that not be twenty million that would come off of the forty-two million dollar construction cost? Well, that so that the city and county would be left with twenty million to fund. Million. Well, to be correct, yes, yeah. twenty-two million. If we stay at a forty-two million dollar complex, so am I just making it too? Well, well that really goes to how you're going to pay it back. The money you're going to use to for the repayment of the debt that gets issued. It doesn't, it doesn't, you can't, um, you have to, you have to borrow the money first or you have to assemble the $40 million first and then the revenues that are generated by the project are how you're going to becomes perhaps part of the picture of, of what you're going to, of how you're going to pay it back and then what other ever sources you want to put into it. It might be a general fund, it might be some from the transit room tax, it might be some from stimulus funds. It, it, there may be other other avenues that we that we do that. But you gotta get the money together uh, first uh, and then rely on that as perhaps part of the repayment strategy. Okay, so I don't understand that. Uh, so we gotta get the 40 million together first, even though we have the ability to borrow 20 million if I'm, if I'm understanding, based upon the revenue stream. So what would the debt service no. that's in that, that $1.5 million of debt service, what does that? Um, so, so no, we, we will not, city and county, based on my experience, will not be able to borrow based on revenue. If you're going to only be able to borrow based on the value of your, of your tax base. Uh, only utility companies get get to borrow off off their revenues. Not okay. nobody's going to borrow you money based on saying, "Well, I'm going to pay it back when I make make uh, uh, money at the park." So we're going to borrow it based on our on our tax base, and and then we can say, "Let's rely on it for for part of our uh, repayment stream." So it could support maybe half of the repayment stream. But that would be a perfect. Perfect. Be in a perfect world, right? That requires a lot of, a lot of choices, and you know it can even go into the question of, of um, are are you putting in grass or are you putting in turf? Turf, you you put your park into production faster. Grass might take you a year or two before you get to that maturity to where you're playing on it, or just depending on the time of the year that it that it opens. That it's going to be cost neutral from the beginning. I think really depends on you know what is what do you count as your first year? You might be 18 months after construction before you're saying I've, I've completed a year or even longer. I think what we would want to do is is secure that potential for income for debt service. I think I don't think we can 
go forth. We can't start a business on the idea of money, we, but we, we can secure it to make sure that we don't have to go beg Jim Dudley to help us make a, a payment. Rather, we have an interlocal agreement that requires him to help us make that payment once that income. But haven't generated. we bonded money in the past based on that income? Like for when the Carson Center, that there's that 2% that's being paid <clears throat> right now for the Expo Center and the Carson Center. So that money was bonded against the hotel tax. That, no, no, it wasn't. Money. No, it wasn't. Yeah. What um, was it bond? Well, it's, um, it's being paid back by the, that tax. Initially, it didn't produce enough, enough income. It produced only um, part of the income. And then the city, the county, and the CVB uh, made up the rest. As that fund grew, um, instead of us using our local tax dollars, um, we used that money uh, first, but not initially. Un initially, we used our our own dollars until until that was enough, and we didn't pledge that revenue uh, as part of the debt. I, th I think we used it as a credit enhancer, but but we we pledged our tax basis as 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 our repayment for it. You're, you're going to get a better rate when you pledge your general obligation, but if you have an identified revenue source, like Steve's talking about, you could uh, pledge that. Well, and that's, I think that's a different question. I mean, is the 2% bondable? If, that, if that's your question, absolutely, because that's a tax that's going to happen every year. But as opposed to bonding the revenue that we hope, I'm just going to It's, call a, it's the same, we isn't it? The 3% for the McCracken County Sports Tourism Commission and the 2%. Absolutely. The 3% is bondable. If, if that's what you're asking, is. I, I, I think I am. I'm, I'm okay. asking. I thought you were talking. I think what he's. Million dollar debt. I, yeah, I think what right. he's saying is that's a tax, and the 1.5 million of debt service is sort of revenue less, less expenses. You know, that's a prediction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, an estimate of what we might do, and it's not, it's not on paper like that. I'm sorry. I thought what you were asking, Commissioner Wilson, was can we bond, the, revenue that's going to be generated from operating. The tournaments, like the tournament fees. Well, the no, the hotel tax, the transit room tax, that three percent oh. that goes to the sports commission. Yes. Can we not use that to bond some of the money for the construction? I, I that's what I, I thought it was I set. Assume, I yeah. thought that's the reason why we set that three percent tax was to actually build the park to have the money to do that. So yeah. why can't I'm not understanding why. No, that is that a different now. question. So now I understand you. So, you know, and and I think it is bondable. I think the question, the way I understand it is, you know, how we choose to use it. I mean, whether or not we want to use some report of it, part of it for maintenance and, uh, you know. Um, but, well, I thought you did say that it was um, the facility will operate at cost neutral. Yeah, that, that is the design at this point, uh, based on all these assumptions and everything we have on paper right now, that is the goal, is it to operate cost neutral. So I guess I'm just going back, to, my question is, the 3% that we put in for the hotel tax for the sports commission, <clears throat> I thought it was to help build the sportsplex and to pay for it, part of it. I, I know it's not paying for all of it, but for a part of it, which it sounds like with the city wanting the county ask, willing to put in 20 and asking the city to put in 20, then none of that money that was originally put in for the hotel tax is being used to build the sports park. That's what it appears. Yeah, I think you're, are you looking at me? <laughs> Whoever. <laughs> I'm looking at you. you I'm just asking the question. Anybody can answer the question? <laughs> it's hard to do. Uh, well, to answer your question, yes, there was, there, was, there was plenty of conversation about a portion of that 3% of the Sports Tourism Commission being used for debt service, and there was some debate over whether we would use all of it for debt service uh, because we would need to actually operate something. So, so when you have the 1.5% in here, for debt service, and you're saying it could do 20 million. I guess I'm just asking then why can't we use that 20 million to build almost half of the sports park, of the sportsplex? Is the $4 million revenue the first year, does that include the uh, transient room tax? No. So the transient room tax is in addition to the $4 million. So if we had a million for transit, is that a million a year on transient room? How, how much we? 1.1, yes. This last year it was around. 
between seven and eight hundred thousand. So the reality is the revenue, including the transient room tax, is going to be four point eight million, taking these numbers. So we're going to have one point five million in these estimates, plus we'll have some of the revenue that we take in from the transient room tax. We'll have some of that available also, in addition for the debt service, if we decide to do that. Yes. So we could have, how, how much does say $400,000, how much does that bond? Five or six million. So if we took the 20 million for the 1.5 million plus the 5 million, we've got $25 million of it covered. But the city and the county have to be responsible for the first Twenty million in case the revenue doesn't come in. If the revenue comes in and we have an interlocal agreement, it can pay some of the debt. But ultimately, the city and the county would be responsible for that initial right. debt. Right. Right. And I hopefully, we have that. the revenue to cover right. some of it. Of twenty million right. each, right. or twenty-one million each. Correct. But we have to do the bonding in the beginning to pay for the whole thing. And then how it's paid off, we have to decide later on as we see revenue come in. Exactly. Can I? Ask another question that I'd asked last week about the Stuart Nelson part being uh, included with that. Uh, the con you know the dog park would have to be relocated, and uh, some at least holes of the disc off. Um, the, those ball fields would need to be relocated that are more used for recreational use, and that um, and potentially entrance road improvements. Is any of that cost related to Stuart Nelson Park included in the 42 million? We we have not included it at this point um, because it, it, we were just trying to get at the what it would cost to build the facility. Um, the the dog park I'll, I'll speak to that specifically. In, in January of 2020, the parks master plan was approved uh, by the city commission, um, and and uh, and within that document, the dog park was uh, slated to be moved to the Anna Balmer section of Noble Park. Uh, so we, we kind of took that as a um, that's part of the parks master plan to, to be done at some point in the future. Um, so we just kind of left that. We, we let the parks master plan speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, the disc golf, um, we we knew there would be some holes that would be disrupted. And so we, we've kind of we've had that in the back of our mind, but we have not accounted for that in the project budget. Uh, we just know that we need to deal with that. And, and that's. Maybe one of that, you know, that may fall into that design contingency where we have to, to add that in. Um, Stewart Nelson Park Road, we have not accounted for that, uh, for improvements there. We know that it, it's uh, um, dangerously narrow at this point and would not be sufficient for, for this type of complex. And so we have not included any of that in um, because it's, it's not our road. It's a public road, and so we just uh, have not chosen to, to include those costs in. Uh, to account for that, so. So, perfect scenario. I see how that works, but, and I think it'll be a good scenario, but if, if we come in at 60, 70% of your projections, what's the city and county on the hook for, Steve? If we don't hit this, if we don't hit this 100%, if we don't hit these numbers, I mean, if we, we open up and it takes two years to ramp up to, to work the perfect scenario. Not to put you know, on the spot or anything. That's, <laughs> that's, but within that's, within that's, $100. That's hard to say. <laughs> yeah, within $100. That's hard, that's hard to predict because there are, there are a lot of assumptions that um, we spent a couple hours with the consultants yesterday. There's... There's a lot that goes into those numbers, and they have high confidence in those numbers, but those aren't decisions you have reached yet um, to say that's a, exactly how this business plan is, is going to uh, work out. And so I think we, we have to, you know, in an or, interlocal agreement, we have to work through those issues and see if that's exactly the way we want to do this. And, and it will begin to, or, or, what, or what you decide to build. So remember the North Star on this thing is sports tourism and, and what will be useful for attracting teams. If later we decide, nah, we don't want to do all that stuff. Well, you know, it's, it begins to erode your, your business plan. So you can't, so you say, I can't afford six soccer fields. I only want to do four right now. 
Well, you can't say you're going to produce 1.5 million in revenue because you'll have fewer teams and fewer kids' plans and all that kind of stuff. So it all it all begins to um, the the business plan that produces the revenue goes hand in hand with the decision of what it is you're going to build. And so that 1.5 is 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 very closely linked to um, the capital expenditure of the 41, 42 million dollars. So. And, and not only that, and then how you decide to operate mm -hmm. it. So is there a further report that breaks down that particular page? Like it, what, there what, is. What it's, makes up the $5 million revenue? I, there, there is. It's, it's in the master plan. I can't quote the pages. I, I want to say it starts on page 44, approximately. I'm just going to go back to... Uh, Commissioner Jones, are you done with your question? Well, are you saying it's in this yes. packet or it's in another one? Oh, it's, it's in the it's in the master plan. Okay. So that's what I, I guess. What I'm interested in knowing is is the pros reforma looking at that in detail to say, all right, they're going to make one million dollars from tournament fees, one million dollars from concessions. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, um, page seventy three. So. Um, in the in the master plan, which you can find correctly on our website, Steve. Okay. Where did Steve go? Yes. It's, on, it's on the city's website as well. So if you go to the master plan, it does a deep dive into the detail of where the revenue uh, comes from. Um, you know, right down to there'll be nine hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in in <coughs> concession stand revenue. And and just just for an example, so we're talking to the consultant. And I'm like, man, that's a lot of hot dogs. He's like, well, based on our experience in other communities, they sell beer. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Um, but we don't do a lot of that in our parks here. So that's sort of, he's like, well, that's a significant part of the concession mm -hmm. revenue. And we're like, we don't really, we don't have a, a lot of experience locally with selling beer in our parks, even though it's commonly done in other communities. So that's one of those decisions that we have to reach to right. say, are you going to produce 1.5 million in revenue? Yeah. So that's why I'm hesitant. Uh, to to say, man, you got you got half of it paid for, uh, just just by but just by running the park. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I was just going to go back to Jeff's comment. I'm a little disheartened, Jeff, that you guys took the approach that since the, the park's master plan has the uh, dog park, that's a multiple year master plan that mm -hmm. you know considers going to move next year. Uh, so that that's additional cost on top of the city's partnership. And as far as the uh, Stewart Park, uh, Nelson Park Road being a dangerous narrow road, again, that's a, a road that we have on our plans to do long term, long range, but again, not that would be expedited and pulled forward. So it's really kind of a little disheartened that it wasn't actually considered <coughs> this master plan for this entire area. Uh, so, one thing that I think that would be more equitable is if we did look at those modifications that would be necessary to make this successful development. Not just say city you're in for X, and also now you got to do this too. I'd like to see it more inclusive. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll be certainly glad to do that. Well, then, real quick on that, if if you guys remember, we met with the last um, mayor and set of commissioners and you about the interlocal agreement as far as Stewart and Nelson Park, and I think that kind of got all put on the back burner with the elections and everything that come through. So we had an initial meeting to discuss all those things. And it just kind of has gotten put on the back burner currently. So the Sports Commission, you know, I think it was reported at one point that we just included Stuart Nelson without permission. That wasn't the case at all. Um, no. Before we had this master plan, we, yeah, we want to yeah. make sure that you guys were okay with that too. So, no problem. Yeah. yeah, I think the agreement was that we were very open to this use, the usage of Stuart Nelson Park. I don't think that's it, it at all. It's just the cost, the extra cost that would be incurred by the city if we were to have to make all those correct those changes to Stuart Nelson Park. No, we were very open to it being yeah. used. But honored, as you said, is not without the changing uh, of being still honoring Stuart Nelson. Right, right. Well, let me, let me say this, and I, I want to say, I want us to be able to talk very frankly and openly about all this and, and without anybody getting ruffled one way or another because these things have to be discussed openly. And, and so... Um, you know, in, in the equities part of it, um, the county is putting in uh, twice the land that the city is. Um, 
the county has one hotel and I don't know how many shops that are going to benefit from the revenue of people. And of course, all these numbers have not, these are all direct numbers that we've heard uh, revenue from this. This is not, none of this is, in, well, some of it did. But, but the impact that it's going to have on uh, hotels themselves, not just the money we take from those uh, hotel overnight bills, but the hotels themselves, uh, the restaurants, the retail shops, the service stations, uh, those are in the city. Uh, the city has 90 percent, I would guess. I've not made an attempt to determine how many there are, but uh, the county has very few uh, businesses, I guess to say in an overall sense, that will benefit uh, by uh, more people coming in to eat in uh, restaurants out in the county, fuel their cars and service stations out in the county, or one hotel that's in the county. And so the, those, uh, um, you know, those sorts of expenses, those, all that revenue really goes to the city. In what, in, but not in sales tax, we don't get anything like that. Well, or, or possibly in the... Tax. What? Yeah. Or hotel, motel tax, transit room tax. None of that. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, if you don't think it would benefit the city for... I don't think that... I mean, we do. It's great commerce for our community. It absolutely brings yeah. people in here and creates businesses. Yeah. It just you, doesn't really what, go to our bottom line. No. It'll help your bottom line with payroll tax and uh, net profits tax. I think, I think okay. it benefits the entire county. Absolutely. It's a good deal. I, right. I think we're all very supportive of it and want to try to work around this I mean as far as uh, I don't know I don't know what it costs to build a uh, dog park and I I think you know uh, maybe we I don't know if we have the time or if this is the time to get down in the details of how much are we gonna you know spend to move a dog park I gosh uh, when you're talking on a 40 million dollar level uh, uh, dog park some chain link fence I guess I don't, I don't go to a dog park uh, but, uh, I mean, as far as the overall benefits, and I think, uh, um, you know, I am of the uh, hope that the city will look at it as the city is going to get a sports complex and a, just an incredible sports complex within the city uh, provided by... Um, um, majority of the land is going to be county land um, and uh, available right in, in one of my, my one of my primary uh, goals when we started talking about when I got elected to this position was uh, do this soccer really but baseball softball is coming on board too but to have it available for uh, the kids in the city our Plan, you know, the county bought years ago out there at Exit 11 uh, uh, fields for soccer, and it fell through, didn't ever get developed. And uh, that would have been, a, uh, I think, a, a mistake to have built that out there because uh, the kids inside the city, uh, a lot of them have, would be challenged to be able to get out there. A lot of people would be challenged to get way out there, probably. Uh, and so um, I just think as far as... Uh, uh, you know, we hear the, uh, the the restaurants, and of course we're in the COVID, and that'll be passed before long. But uh, you hear the the restaurants, the shops, whatnot. For one thing, they can't get workers for now, but that'll that'll come around after a while. But I think the people that are going to come in here, I guess my point is, uh, the activity will be in the city. It'll be spurring uh, uh, potential growth. I've already had uh, one person uh, Saturday. Um, in a, as a business right there near that park site said uh, that he's going to announce very soon a uh, large expansion of his business based only on maybe you know who I'm talking about oh, that's uh, great though. yeah and and that's going to happen I think uh, all through that corridor there um, and so the occupational tax uh, you know the uh, you know the development within the city, the uh, just the commerce in general, um, and, and again, all those things have not really been uh, 
and I don't know. You know, the state has this formula I always question. It's like every dollar that's spent turns over, you know, like a hundred times, and it's you know this astronomical number. I never did believe that, but uh, they put it out there, and maybe, maybe so. It's you're going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and and it depends on, of course, the business. Uh, a, a national chain store, I guess they take the money and they pay their people, and then the rest of it goes to Denver or you know wherever the corporate headquarters is. Uh, but our little coffee shops, our little local shops, they they get and they're going to get a big boost out of something like this. Judge, there's no question, you know, that uh, a project of this size and scope could <clears throat> make a huge impact on the community. Um, it's just that we've got to figure out how to make sure that we can pay for it in a fiscally responsible manner. And so that's something that, uh, you know, we, did th we need to think through. Um, the, you know, the hotel tax, um, kind of going back to that issue that, that uh, Commissioner Wilson brought up, I think uh, I think it was quoted to me that <clears throat> right now we're at the rate of about eight hundred thousand dollars a year or so on the the, the 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 new tax, you know, for the sports commission. Um, Pre-COVID, it was one point two. Post-COVID, I mean, oh, what could it be? It could be, you know, one point. Who knows? One point five. Um, so. You know, that, to your point, you know, that was established, you know, for just this sort of thing. And so somehow, in my view, that's got to be included, you know, it, you know in, in debt service and somehow uh, making that be a part of the project. Um, that's just a personal feeling I have, you know, because, uh, because there was, I mean, it was a... Um, uh, it was a it was a it was a good move. It's proven to be a good move, and and we think that post COVID, um, you know, there's more hotels being being filled with the uh, uh, with the volleyball courts and and all that's that's happened. And so we're hoping that that revenue goes up. Uh, we just have to account for it, you know, and somehow make sure that it's included in our plans. Um, so and whether or not that's you know, help support the the debt service. Um, you know, um, so I mean, we just we need to think about it. Uh, we need to we need to reflect on, you know, everything that we've talked. Uh, I want to make sure, though, before we I want to make sure that if any of, of the other commissioners, uh, Commissioner Galt. No, my questions um, were the same as Commissioner Wilson's. Okay. It was about the tax and the same as CVB and where the debt service was coming from. It, it was all right in the same line. Okay. Um, so I, I think we're all on the same, or the three of us are obviously on the same page, so I don't know. Commissioner Guess, you got I agree. It's um, probably other than Rick is I deal with construction every day, and um, I know the water board, the five percent doesn't come close. I mean, I wonder if the real cost. But we won't know that till we get in it. Um, I think it's a great idea. You know, I want to. That's just what I'm. What if the forty million turns into sixty million? You know, when it comes and and then what do you do? Yeah, because uh, I know cost. As Rick knows, I don't think five percent touches where we were a year ago, when probably a lot of these numbers. Inflation you're speaking of, right? Just yeah. yes. I mean, just. The real cost today versus six months ago, a year ago, is totally different. Commissioner Henderson, any thoughts, questions? Well, obviously, I think it's an absolute excellent uh, move for the city and for uh, the county. But from day one, from when we, when I began to learn about all of this, I was always told that the the transient tax uh, was to go toward this kind of program. So we got to figure out where that, where, that, where that actually goes. And then I think we've got to figure out uh, where we find the money. And I think, I think we've expressed before that the city has some uh, other priorities as well. And so we want to try to make sure that we are able to meet some of the obligations of those priorities. And, and this is a part of our priority. 
Right. But we can't, I can't see us giving the total amount of bond money that we have to just this. So I'm looking for something that's going to be a win-win for both the city and for the county. But it's what we've been presented tonight is absolutely who, who would not go along with something like this. We just have to figure out how we're going to do this. Let me, let me say that on the uh, transient room tax, the, we've had some discussions about that, and we have uh, some. We've not, uh, of course, made a decision on it, but uh, have differing opinions about it. But it was not uh, not to be used toward this, but it, uh, the viewpoint, and I think this uh, excludes it because we were looking at uh, possibly using it uh, in about a 10-year period uh, you have some capital uh, replacements to make, fields wear out, uh, things get old and damaged, uh, rehab, uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, looking at using that, holding it in a reserve to put toward that. My opinion, I like, I'm always, it seems like a middle ground guy, so I always, I was thinking maybe we put half of it, or roughly half, toward debt service, half of it in, in a bank to, in a reserve to, so that we would have the money to do those capital improvements. You don't want to have a, a real nice facility that's now worn out and you've got to, those those fields are a million dollars. So uh, some of them are, and so that was uh, what we we're thinking about on that. But I, uh, Mr. Doolittle, that uh, I don't guess I was real understood completely. You're saying that we could uh, bond uh, based on the transient room tax revenue, even though it's uh, it's not really a fixed amount. And obviously, it depends on how many people stay in the hotels, but if we could bond on that, uh, are you saying we would still, well, we still would uh, need the cost of the project, whatever it is, 40 million up front, um, but uh, the the transit room tax, that half of that, let's say, uh, would just be used to pay back that debt. Or is it of more benefit than that? Correct. So you just you know, look at what the total project cost is and, and how you're going to pay for certain segments of it. Some of it may very well come from revenue produced by the project. Some of it may come from transient room tax. Some of it, you know, just may come from other local tax sources. So if we have a, let's just say for a minute, it's 40 million. We get it done. Uh, well, of course, you've got to borrow the money up front. Uh, we borrow 40 million, bond 40 million. Um, and then we decide uh, we're going to use uh, half the transient room tax to bank for replacement, uh, half to pay off the debt. Um, then we'll just have uh, that money will be uh, that much less that the city and the county will have to come up with. To right, and you pay you're still talking, debt. you know, some more, some more money that won't cover cover all of it mm -hmm. and then I, th I think we need to get into so what what happens if you get into an operational deficit if you have a covid year where you have you have set fixed costs and overhead but you're not getting the tournaments or you've got the wrong management team in place and, and they're not turning the business or or you collectively make decisions about recreation that affect how much rental and how much um, weekend tournament time time you have and and it and it doesn't produce that much so so you can use the trend it really the transit room tax is going to be used it's where you're going to insert it right. you can insert it right up front for debt or you're going to insert it for um, your operating subsidy or are you going to save it as the judge suggests for uh, capital uh, replacements uh, so you heard your uh, Jeff say um, if you end up with an all synthetic facility um, they'll start getting replaced in in um, in eight to ten years. Um, so so you're going to have a twenty year twenty year note to build the park, but yet you're going to find yourself needing money and funds um, halfway through that that term to start replacing things. But all of that's hammered out in an interlocal, or could be correct. Yes, yes, exactly. Isn't that how, as we've done in a other million times areas, before. Yes. Isn't okay. Sorry, what'd you ask? 
Uh, I, that all of those details could be hammered out in an interlocal, right. as we've done with right. several other exactly. things. Right. <laughs> Correct me just, if I'm wrong. I'm sorry. No. Isn't that how you did the Carson Center? Didn't uh, the city CVB pledge 1% of its 3% to Carson Center? I thought you delivered that news. Not, not, not exactly, but um, when we borrowed the money for the Carson Center and for the Expo Center, it was a $9 million note. We um, passed the 2% tax at that time. It didn't cover um, the entire amount of the cost, so there was a, a plan between the city, the county, and the CVB to come up with the overage. And But slowly over time, as, as the transit room tax grew and became stronger, um, uh, the city and the county and the CVB stopped contributing money into that debt service, and we pay for it entirely now. But if for something were to happen, like if COVID had gotten really serious and, and wiped us out, we would have been back to digging that out of our tax right. dollars. Steve, if I recall, well, we redid some of the bond issues for the Carson Center, but the county tax base is responsible for repaying that. Is that correct? Not well, the convention center or not the Carson Center? Ultimately, we pledged our tax base. Right. We use those resources first, provided they're available. But if push came to shove and the revenue wasn't there, we would we would have to get it from. But we had to our, do that in the bond issue to yes. say that the county it was, the only, tax it was really base, the only way to borrow. I remember reading that and saying the, that our the money. tax, our county general fund revenue tax base, was going to pay for that. But then the interlocal agreement reimburses. The payment for those bonds. Right. It said which dollars we're going to put in first, and um, and and fortunately, it has worked out for very many years that we haven't had to use our our other general governmental tax resources to pay for it. The transit room tax pays for it. So I want to go back to the numbers just one more time. Sorry, but you said a moment ago, 1.5 million dollars in debt service funds, 40 40 million of debt. So 20, 20 million. Oh, 20 million. Rough, oh, I'm roughly. sorry. I'm sorry. 20 million. You said that right. And so half of that, 750,000, you know, would fund 10 million somewhere in that neighborhood. So, you know, if if we assume that uh, that post COVID, you know, that we're going to get, um, you know, that that transient room tax is going to continue to grow with everything that we're doing. You know, then we may have 10 million, you know, of what we need, to your point earlier. And so rather than, you know, I mean, if uh, that's just something to, you know, that, that's on my mind. As Commissioner Galt brought up in the interlocal agreement on the Convention Center and the Carson Center, we, we built those triggers in there. So as that fund grew, um, what we dug out of out of our city and county budgets and CVB budgets uh, went went down. So I think we could we could come up with a similar arrangement here as to um, um, what happens when those when those funds grow, but also what happens when those when those funds uh, constrict. So when when we signed the interlocal agreement to establish the sports commission to put that three percent hotel tax on, and it. I guess, how are we going to, if we weren't going to use those funds to pay for building the sports park, sportsplex, how, how were we going to build it? How was it going to be built? How is it going to be paid for? Well, we'd have to do a bond issue thing. But uh, in, we're, we are, and of course, this money also doesn't include those uh, naming rights and a lot of other things that we're talking about. I didn't realize that it did the, I didn't realize it covered that 1.5 million worth of uh, debt was in the break even. Assumptions on top of assumptions. Right. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, well, it was it was never enough to pay for, for everything. Um, you know, you had the capital expense of a park that we didn't know if we were going to build just soccer, just baseball, softball, or, you know, where we're at now is is, is doing it all together, or how to operate it, or, or, how, to, how, or how to replace it uh, as, as we go. It's just not enough money to, to do it all. Okay. So it just wasn't there, really, to build it from that money. 
Well, not no, all. I, I think it was enough. always right. It was always envisioned that it would be used in part for debt service and in part for operations. I mean, for example, <clears throat> your the, the what, what is now the city CVP about sixty percent of that revenue goes toward salaries and operations. The Sports Tourism Commission hasn't incurred that kind of liability yet, yet. Uh, mm -hmm. for the purpose of reserving that, I think, for, for debt service. I, I don't want to think that we are trying to s save some of that transient room tax to not uh, apply it toward that because we can squeeze you guys for that money instead and we just hold on to that. That's what that was the discussion about do we need to save some of it. Uh, I think we had the debate on where we ended up on it. Uh, I thought I that naming rights money was going to be used for that. Or, for capital for the future. Uh, well, that money was being put in. That's about half million a year. 1.5 million is respected for a five year, so that's yeah. a half million yeah, a year. Yeah, it's projected at, three. I think, 3.2 million over five years. Um, and so... You know, with synthetic fields, every eight to ten years, <coughs> you're replacing turf, and so that you know, eight hundred thousand dollars per field times fourteen um, fields. That you know, that that adds up quickly. So yeah, that that is reserved for those capital improvements, but it's not enough. The naming rights on its own to to do that. And also remember, we use that transient room tax to pay for the four courts at the Expo Center. There's a replacement of those down the road. You know, they're not going to last forever. And there's already a request for more basketball, volleyball in the area from the teams that are coming here to, to, to travel here. So it is being used for sports like it, like it's intended to. Well, they put some of that money back they're bringing in, the $1.2 million so far? Or? I think with the convention center closed, I don't know that she's made money yet. I think it's covering or almost breaking even. But until she's fully operational, I don't think there's extra money to be putting back right now. She does. They do get the convention center does get two percent right. from the transit tax now. So that's right. One percent from the county part and one yes. percent from the city yes. part. They do get that two percent, but that's not used to. Is that used just for operations? It's not used for anything on the sports. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to speak for Michelle. I know that they've uh, they bought the cover for the courts to be able to put events where you don't have to pick them up and you know move the courts every time. I think one of those covers is about forty thousand dollars to get the ones you can walk on and stuff. Um, you know, and, and probably some other improvements they've made in the area. So the only thing we've purchased there so far was the courts. Um, I believe Chris, did they buy the curtains too? No, we bought the curtains. We bought the curtains. Okay, so we bought the courts and the curtains. She bought the court flowers or court floor covers. Mm -hmm. So, and how much have we sent, spent so far out of the transit room tax? I'd have to get back on you on the exact number. Um, we bonded some of that. We bonded the courts. Yeah, we bonded the courts. And I think we paid for the curtains. But I think to your point, Commissioner Wilson, we don't want we don't want to create a situation where the city and the county are barely making it, and the Sports Tourism Commission is is the wealthiest entity in town, uh, other than the library. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I think it is, you know, when I, I compared this type of venture, to, compared to the Carson Center, say we're price, uh, I guess, in perspective, compared to the convention center, compared to the airport, none of the three of those entities have the upside that this has. I think that's what this has that they don't. We all know we want it. We know that from studies. We know that from the most important study that we do, and that's when we go knock door to door during our campaigns. I bet you all of us have heard this is what we want you to do. Go do it. Um, so I think the, the good piece that I see is that three years ago when we were sitting here, we didn't have the extra income from the transit room. We didn't have bluegrass downs. Now we do. We've got a little bit of a little bit of progress toward that and we hope that you join us you complete us <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful plan no doubt about it it's a beautiful plan i think my point was i thought the hotel tax that the new hotel tax was supposed to pay for some of the construction and let's squeeze let's use some of that if we can Absolutely. to lower the obligation from the city and the county so that we can make it work i think that's what we're trying to say we want to try to make it work i couldn't agree with you more 
Yeah. One other thing I do want to mention, though, you, you, Judge, you did talk about kids playing on top of the landfill, and I've been out there on Saturdays a couple of week, in the couple through the years and the last couple of weekends uh, watching a four-year-old play, mm -hmm. and it is on top of a landfill, but those fields will still be needed. Right. Yes, I would keep so, them. Those kids will still play there on Saturdays, mm -hmm. and so I, I hope that you know we can make, look at some ways to do some more permanent uh, fixtures out there. They did have the second gate open last Saturday, which helped a lot with the flow out of there. Uh, love to see some nicer restrooms and some things like the, some amenities there, but they will be. But there will be use local use, as you've said, Monday through Thursday. Yes, here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It, it, we'd be that, glad for you guys to help us on the. On the <laughs> Sorry, open a can of worms. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I'm well, out there. <laughs> well, and we have, uh, of course, we are joining the, you guys with the uh, with the 911. But uh, I'm going to track from this talk. But I think we're I think we're right there on the verge of finding the solution to that 911. And I think that'll uh, not be a concern too much longer. I would just say if there, I think there's a way we could lower the cost from the 20 million that you're needing from the city. Some, I think that would help us to have money for some of the other priorities yeah. that you know you talked about, Reverend Henderson, and some of us have in our parties that we've done. So if there are ways to look at that with the hotel tax to be used from what you know for the construction and to raise those funds, I think that would help us. I'm just speaking for me on that part, but. Yeah. I, I, I think that's the case. Yeah. All right. Well, we've been at two hours. I don't know if we can, got I, can I make a comment? You done? Yeah. Are you going? Are you not going to really say yes tonight? Then. <laughs> you said you weren't going to ask. You said you. <laughs> Bill had something. Can I make a comment? Oh, I'm can sorry. I, can I make a comment? Yeah. Sure. Well, one of my concerns from the beginning is not the project itself, because I think it's an excellent project. Uh, I think we all read through the report. And we were impressed with it, and seeing the presentation tonight, we're even more impressed. I've been getting texts from people saying, go for it, you better vote for it, and, <laughs> and people say it's an awesome project, so I think it's really good. But my concern, I think, is like uh, Commissioner Wilson's mentioning, was the, the uh, ultimate cost of it and, and the bonding responsibility. I didn't want to see the county get in a responsibility where we were having a, if we were to even pay $20 million of the $40 million cost, where we would have a two to $3 million bond payment every year, because I was afraid five years down the line, we would be in a financial situation again of having uh, difficulty meeting all our obligations but paying off those bonds. But uh, uh, tonight my, my opinion is, is changed some because of the projection of $1.5 million a year for bond payment that will be in the revenue. Ultimately, the city and the county have to be responsible for, if it's $40 million, ultimately <clears throat> we have to be responsible for the $40 million. But hopefully down the line somewhere, some of that will be offset on the annual bond payments by the profits uh, from the $1.5 million projection that's coming from the, uh, the revenue from the facility itself. So hopefully five years down the line, instead of spending $2.5 million in bond debt, maybe we'll have a $1 million or $1.5 million. And I think we'll take a look at, at the revenue from the transient room tax to see how much of that can be put in there. I mean, I'm willing to, uh, I guess, take the build it and they will come type um, attitude toward this and be very positive toward it of what it's going to do for the community and the revenue it's going to bring in and be responsible in the beginning for, I'll say, our share of the, of the 40 million, of the 20 million dollars that will be responsible for that. But with the understanding and the confidence that Five years down the line, we're going to be bringing enough revenue to pay some of that bond issue, and uh, and uh, and the revenue from the transient room tax, which hopefully will continue to improve. They're still building hotels in Paducah, so we still have a lot. So again, my concern is the forty million dollar cost. I know the county and the city will be ultimately responsible if that's the rate we go, but I think down the line, in five years from now, I think our obligation for payment under a Interlocal agreement will have it less than what that will be. So, uh, Judge, I know you and I have talked a little bit, and I expressed concern about the overall cost. But mm -hmm. I'm confident now, if if we want to trust their numbers of the, <clears throat> even if it comes in at, at 750 thousand, that can be used for bond debt, that's still 10 million dollars, uh, and payments for that. So hopefully it comes in more than that, and and uh, 
um, I'm convinced we need to move forward on it. We need to move forward as quickly as we can to get it going and uh, with the understanding. I mean, maybe we come up with a plan that we find a way to put some cash money into it. Maybe, again, if the county's responsibility is $10 million, maybe we can put some cash into it and, and bond part of it, and then hopefully the bond payment will be made later on through the, uh, um, through the those other revenue sources. Maybe the city could do that, put a certain amount of cash into it now with a smaller bond issue, and hopefully it will be paid off through the other. But all that, we each have to be responsible for hopefully $20 million of the cost. And I'm ready to move forward, Judge. I have, uh, the presentation tonight was excellent. And again, uh, the text I got, the people I got it from, I better agree to it or I'm in trouble. <laughs> is, is Gosh, that she must an be option? pretty, pretty influential Car person. Car whoever <laughs> was yeah, it your wife? Yeah, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but, but is that an option? How we could potentially do that? You're talking about the city. Put, I mean, the county putting in ten million now, and the city putting in ten million now. Is that an option? I, I think we'd have to get the forty million in the beginning. Okay. We have to be have the forty million. So we million. would have to be willing to commit to twenty million, as you are, as far as the county right. is willing. You From, have the I, I think from the very beginning we have to go ahead and commit the twenty million now. We have to have the forty million dollars either in the. We bank have to have a forty million dollar commitment. Commitment, right? To made. From we don't have forty beginning. million dollars in cash. Right. We got to put forty million dollar commitment. Right. And, and somehow we got to figure out how, you know, how to come well. up with that. Yeah. And I just point out, Bill, some of the, you know, your remarks, I appreciate them, I mean, but some of those assumptions, and Steve made this point earlier, you know, I mean, making good decisions going forward about how the sports park is run and what those puts and takes are about, you know, when we let people use them and whether or not we hire the right people and how we set it up for over oversight going forward, those are, those are critical decisions right. that have to be thought through on the front end. Well, and, and I, I want to come back to that thing about, you know, these are really extremely conservative, uh, I think. And, I, and uh, Jim, I don't remember what you said, the number. Of course, these are based on one-day tournaments. And I don't remember. What did you tell me? How, what yeah. percentage of tournaments are actually two one day, days? One-day tournaments brings in 8 to $10 million in direct spending. But you, I know from softball, baseball, almost every tournament's two days. Because um, yeah, so they figured a out, tournament. they figured out during COVID they can make us come for two days and you know space us out more. We're not spaced out more, but yeah. <clears throat> that makes us there for two days, which means two days of gate fees, <coughs> hotel rooms, all that fun stuff. So it's just a one day tournament figures here, yeah. and so the revenue is obviously, well, obviously, but it's roughly twice that amount for a two day tournament. And, and Mayor, so, you mentioned the running of the ballpark. We've already we're three meetings yeah. in to trying to figure out what the right way to whether it's outsourcing all that, whether it's hiring people here, we're already having those conversations, gathering that knowledge, because you're right, if you don't run it the right way. Um, I've been to several ballparks that just weren't ran the right way, and there's nobody there. And and it's just uh, it's unfortunate because they're nice, but they didn't build it the right way or they don't run it the right way. And, you know, yeah. if, uh, they, say, they say in travel ball you have to make the mom happy. That's what they told us, the pros told us. And if mom has to wait in the concession stand and miss their kid bat, they're not very happy. So how your concession stand runs, how long the bathroom line is. Um, do I have to drag my four-year-old two miles to the ballpark, or is it, do I get to park right by it? All these things make, make these things run successfully. What, what's the timeline on that decision? And second question, who's the decider of that decision? So those decisions, I'm going to put you guys back on the spot now, those decisions are, are kind of on hold until we know what we can build, right? So until we know how much money we have and what we can build, then we can start making those decisions, better informed decisions. Um, we don't have a, a fine timeline. I mean, again, we're, we're talking right now about party, uh, potentially putting out a request for information from some of these management companies to get a better understanding of what that looks like. Um, and then we have to decide, are they employed by the county? Are they employed by the Sports Tourism Commission? You know, what does that look like? So there's still lots of information we're still gathering. Uh, I think to Mayor, Mayor's point, I think I – would feel more comfortable knowing that that decision is not going to be made before we voice an opinion. No, the elected no. officials on it. No, we're still gathering information. We're nowhere near making that decision yet. Okay. On the corporate sponsorships, why was five years picked? Why not on the large ones move it out to seven or ten? As far as the estimate, the estimates. I mean, 
I, I think it's just what uh, what pros sees in industry standards and, and other facilities of this size. Um, and again, it, it's a conservative number. Uh, we we could have said seven to ten years, but is you know how much would that happen? And so we we all, all, every number you see in this is conservative. Um, and, and I, I I feel like I'm overstressing that, but but I think it needs to be reminded. These are all very you know the, these the economic spending is based on a 45.8% um, rate of people staying overnight. Half the people we're projecting don't even stay overnight. And so I don't know that that's, you know, that's a safe assumption. Um, so I, we just tried to have, have be very cautious as we provide these numbers. We don't want decisions to be made on numbers that are uh, elevated uh, in a, in a manner that it's not helpful. Um, <clears throat> and so we, we want decisions to be made by, by the sports commission and, and these two bodies to, to be, you know, based on conservative information. And so that's, that's why some of these numbers are like they are. Do I have any more questions or anything we need to talk about? Nope. I'm thinking about a motion to adjourn. Does that sound good or what? Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Could well, we have a I motion to adjourn? Do, do we motion have one? To adjourn. Okay. Yeah. Do we have a second? You're going to second it? Uh, we're going to do it as one body then? Can we do that? You both yeah. have to have one. We, we, uh, we both have to do it. Can't. You probably got to do your thing. We got to do our thing. Uh, okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. okay. Keep talking. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Opposed? We're done. All right. How about Motion to adjourn. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We're gone. Thank, thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Good, healthy discussion. <laughs>